Okay. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on understanding the federal acquisition regulation. My name is Christina Kunkel and I'm the program director for the NorCal PTAC, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Today I'm just gonna speak briefly about the services of the PTAC and SBDC programs before our talented procurement specialist, Lenny Bean, begins his presentation. So the NorCal PTAC is a program of the NorCal SBDC. The PTAC and the SBDC are both federally funded and hosted by Humboldt State University Sponsored Programs Foundation up in Arcata, California. The NorCal PTAC is funded to provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling services on procurement topics to businesses in Del Norte, Humboldt, Mendocino, Shasta, Siskiyou, Solano, and Trinity Counties. Those are shown on the map on your left in green. And these county restrictions are determined by federal definitions of economically distressed counties. There are about 100 other PTACs across the US. The NorCal SBDC is shown here on the map to the right in red. The SBDCs provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling services on more general business topics, and they may sometimes be able to assist with procurement topics as well. Their service area slightly overlaps the PTAC service area from the Oregon border in Del Norte County all the way down the coast in the Bay Area and down to Santa Cruz County. To apply for SBDC services, you can click on the blue link here to find the SBDC nearest you. If you're unsure which service center is appropriate for your needs and location, don't hesitate to contact me and I'll direct you to the appropriate resource. The NorCal PTAC provides three core services, all of which are free to clients within the PTAC service area displayed on the previous slide. The first is one-on-one -on -one counseling. Our experienced procurement specialists can help you with SAM registration, DUNS numbers, certifications, crafting capability statements, GSA schedules, and any other government contracting topics. We can help you understand where your business fits in the government marketplace and how to market yourself. Your local SBDC can also provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling on more general business topics like how to start a business, how to write a business plan, how to get a loan, and more. Second, we provide free webinars like this one and in-person workshops on government contracting topics. We'll show you a list at the end of this presentation of our upcoming free events. And these webinars and workshops are open to anyone, regardless of their location. And third, we can set up those within our service area with a free bid matching service with daily access to federal, state, and local opportunities. We also post local opportunities on our Facebook page, so make sure you like us. So to apply for NorCal PTAC services, visit norcalptac.org and click on the big green button on the front page. Don't hesitate to call me if you have any questions about your eligibility for our services or which resource is most appropriate for you. My direct phone number is 707-826-3922, or you can email us at info at norcalptac.org. And the content of this presentation was provided by the Georgia Tech Procurement Assistance Center. So thank you to Georgia Tech. And finally, a quick housekeeping note, you're all muted to avoid distractions in the background. If you have any questions during the presentation, please move your mouse to the bottom of the screen. A black bar will appear as seen in this photo. Click on the chat button on the bottom middle of the screen to send a message. And Lenny will have about 10 minutes at the end to answer your questions. So now I'm pleased to welcome NorCal PTAC Procurement Specialist, Lenny Bean. Good morning, everyone. So today we talk about federal acquisition regulations. Um, we are not trying to make all of you experts. I don't think that as 40 years I've been doing this, that I'm an expert either, but certainly can, we can learn how to find what we need to submit bids and perform on contracts with the federal government. So we're gonna acquaint you with those rules. Um, we talk about you know a few of the basic tips of how to find things, why it's important, and how to use it. 
Now, we also say that federal rules kind of give you some insights on state and local government contracting. However, they do not use the federal acquisition regulation itself, but some of them are similar and some of them are not. So you have to be a little careful when you're dealing with county, city, uh, schools, and other government entities. Uh, some of them will actually you know, copy the, the far over and, and use some of those things, but uh, not, on, <clears throat> excuse me, not on an everyday basis. So what is it? It's the title is Federal Acquisition Regulation. Um, most departments in the federal government use it. I say most. So there are several that don't. That's the U.S. Postal System, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, um, TVA, the U.S. Mint, uh, are a few that don't use the federal acquisition regulation as stated. They pattern their activities and they use that far as their body of knowledge to create their own uh, contracting rules for those individual agencies, but they don't mirror what's in the federal acquisition regulation. So you got to be careful of what agencies you're working with and understand what they use as their contracting rules. So we'll go through an overview. We'll talk about why it's important. Uh, purpose, structure, and use, explain how to get around it, how to navigate through the federal acquisition regulation. And we'll have uh, three more uh, seminars on, on the FAR, uh, and we'll get more involved in how it works in the planning, forming, and the actual administration of those federal contracts. So it's a set of regulations through rulemaking. Now, I don't know how many of you out there remember Schoolhouse Rock. I think uh, some of my children uh, probably has, uh, have watched this, but it's a very long process to get to a regulation. And I'll just play uh, maybe a minute of the Schoolhouse Rock video. So I think you get the uh, general idea. Um, it does take a uh, long time before uh, it actually gets into regulation. Um, and it starts with that, um, uh, an event, if you will, um, when rules are made. So that event is when legislation gets passed. Uh, Act of Congress, there might be executive orders by the president um, that initiates a rule change. But that's the first step. It has to have the effect of law when that, when that happens, when they initiate it. Um, so if it's an executive um, um, execution, then it has to be in the effect of law. So Congress will enact statutes affecting public policy, but they leave the details of their implementation to the executive branch. So that, that happens on occasion where they'll come up and they'll pass a bill and then they'll go to the executive branch to actually um, move out into the uh, rulemaking itself and finally into the FAR. So in order for those laws to get implemented, rules have to be written and they have to be reviewed. 
So proposed rules first get published in the Federal Register. Then after that, the, uh, those proposed rules, which will include citations of authority, who's doing it, an explanation of the purpose of that rule, and also an invitation for comment. The time for response to the proposed rules is usually 30 to 60 days. Now these proposed rules do get published in the Federal Register at gpoaccess.gov if anybody's interested in looking at them and providing their own input. Then each council will issue a final rule based on the comments received from that 60 to 90 day period. The Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council, the FAR Council, uh, is responsible for implementing those procedures. So that final rule also provides a lot of insight into what the council members had intended when it was issued. So then from that point, the FAR rules, uh, if you look at chapter 48, uh, chapter one of title 48 of the code of federal regulations, and we'll get into that a little bit, um, that's where that final rule resides. Um, contracting officers, follow what's in the Federal Acquisition Regulation. So until it gets into um, the Federal Acquisition Regulation body of knowledge, um, they're not gonna use it. So now let me give you an example of rulemaking and how long it takes. Well, let me give you two examples. So the first one is the Equity and Contracting for Women Act. It started back in the year 2000. Um, then in 2010, the SB, SBA proposed a rule. It took 10 years between the act was passed and the SBA finally proposed some rules. Then we went through the public comment um, and then the SBA proposed that final rule. So as you can see, by the time SBA proposed that rule, um, it took 11 years to get the government's women-owned small business program, and it's still evolving today. So as an example, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2014 added additional NAICS codes to the women-owned small business program, and under certain conditions allow for sole source uh, contracting to those certified women-owned small businesses. That implementation by, the, implementation by the SBA was in 2016, last year. So we had another five years, so now you have a total of 16 years as this thing is initially set up until it's finally into the Federal Acquisition Regulation and uh, becomes effective, and then there are changes after that. The other example I have is the hub zone certification. And if you're interested, um, by the way, on any of the women-owned small business certifications, hub zone, et cetera, um, that's where we're here to help you get through those uh, wickets as well. So the hub zone, historically underutilized business uh, program is based on census. And so the current hub zone map, it's a ge geographic map of where you're located to get into the program. That map was done based on the census done in the year 2000 and approved by Congress in 2012. So we're currently using a 2000 map approved by Congress in 2012. And now we've had the 2010 census. And so we're waiting for Congress to act to see if there's gonna be any changes to those hub zone maps. So there's, that's a couple of things that touch base right away with a lot of our small businesses. So now we have some rules. Now we go through the acquisition process. So a federal agency established what it needs, lays out the requirements, selection of sources, awards the contracts, and then there's payments and contract administration. So the acquisition process, what we're talking about here is every step taken from womb to tomb, if you will, uh, in the contracting process from when you initial identify what the buying need is, all the way to closing out a contract. And that close out of the contract could take several years even after the contract has been performed. So a contracting officer 
they use the FAR, which includes every single one of these steps. You have to understand that that contracting officer is in a position where he has to follow those rules as they are laid out. So what is the FAR? I call it a body of knowledge for federal contracting. Um, it's, the, it's, it's their Bible, it's, their, it's the, how they set up and, and understand what their rules are and how to go about buying uh, for the federal government. It also places limits, limits on agencies' authority to purchase funds using funds appropriated by Congress. Uh, very important. Uh, and generally it requires full and open competition, although they will do set-asides for small businesses. So not all federal agencies are required to use the FAR. Um, some agencies, when I talked to them about before, is like the U.S. Postal Service, the Tennessee Valley Authority, U.S. Mint, GAO, and the FAA. However, they rely on that body of knowledge, that FAR, to create their own rules. And, and even those contracting officers will have training every year on the FAR and what the changes are so that they know whether or not they have to adjust their rules. So, a couple of facts here. So it was authorized back in 1974, um, and I'm afraid to say, but I actually started using the FAR in 1974, <laughs> uh, as, we, as it was coming out of the federal, it became federal procurement policy. So in 84, that's the first edition in its final form, and it was printed. We would get this stack of paper and put it into this very uh, small book. It was uh, very, very paper thin um, pages, and that really uh, stuff that easy to tear. Um, so this kind of reiterates that it can take a long time for that act of Congress to be implemented because the Office of Federal Procurement Policy Act of 74, and 10 years later, they actually published something in its final form. Updates are sent out, amended every single month. Uh, we don't think there's gonna be a lot of major changes this month. Uh, I went to a National Contract uh, Management Association meeting and looked at what some of the changes are trickling down, but there was nothing significant specifically for small businesses, although there was some changes. Now you can go online, much easier. So how it's arranged, gotta figure out how you get through it. So it's arranged, so the first chapter is the Title 48, the Code of Federal Regulations, as you see in the slide. And the first division is a sub-chapter, then there are eight sub-chapters. And then we have to go from, so if we go from chapter to subchapters to parts. And there are 53 parts in the FAR, each covering a specific piece of that acquisition process. So it's important that you're able to find, so if you have a particular contract or you've registered in SAM to do business with the federal government, which I'll talk to in a little bit, uh, very important to know what you're signing up for. So let's do go through an example. <clears throat> so each of the four number sections here. So you can see the part, number 25, uh, the digits to the left of the decimal point. So if you go all the way down to 25108-2 is a subsection. So to the left of the decimal point represents the part, the number of the part of the FAR. The numbers to the right of the decimal point and to the left of the dash in the order of the subpart. Um, that becomes a subpart, it's one or two digits, and then the section is also uh, two digits. And the numbers to the right of the dash represents the subsection. And then in addition to that, you can, uh, a paragraph can be referenced in there by A, B, C, D after that dash two. So this is an example of how it breaks down. So um, you can take this and each 
piece as it breaks down. Um, so if you're looking at a particular part of the part of the acquisition process, you may just go right to 25. But if you know what you're looking for, you could go to that uh, subsection and get information uh, at that level. Pretty easy to get around. So there are supplements to the Federal Acquisition Regulation. So each branch of uh, the service within DOD plus 22 civilian agencies also have FAR supplements. Um, the main point here is, is that a lot of, uh, on a lot of occasions because of what that agency does, the FAR doesn't cover all of what they need. So they will create a uh, supplement to the Federal Acquisition Regulation and then they will implement that um, sometimes in addition to the FAR or on a standalone basis referencing an original FAR clause. Um, so, so you need to know the agency you are working with and whether or not they have um, lower level FAR requirements than just the Federal Acquisition Regulation. But the Defense Department is a great one. They have a lot of Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation supplements. Um, so if you're working with the Department of Defense, you spend a lot of time looking at their DFARs as well as the FAR itself. So make sure you understand what FAR regulations or what supplements are available for the agency that you are interested in working with. So, moving on, so these are the federal agencies that have the FAR supplements. And again, it's unique to their operation or, or mission. Uh, for example, the Health and Human Services has very specific things that they have to focus on that wouldn't be a part of the overall federal acquisition regulation. So they create some supplements that work for their organization. Um, so this is a list of those that are uh, by federal agencies, uh, and it runs from Chapter 1 all the way down to Chapter 54. And again, important to look at this, if you're going to do business with, say, the Air Force, then you would go to Chapter 53, and you look at Parts 5300 to 5399, and that's going to be the Air Force FAR supplement. Need to understand those on those specific agencies for the Air Force. So these supplements issued by agencies both implement and supplement the FAR. So the implementation is the, provides the direction. So it's very important for contractors to pay attention to that supplement by the agency they have that contract with. Now there's also a thing called deviations. Now deviation is created by an agency. When it is created by an agency, it can affect just one contract, yours, or it can affect a class, a category, or type of contracts. It may affect all fixed price contracts. It may affect all things that are under the simplified acquisition rule, um, those types of deviations. So you gotta understand and look at if there are deviations um, on your contract or anything that you are bidding on. So finding things in the FAR is always fun. I mentioned before when I started it was paper. We had loose leaf little pieces of paper that would come every single day and we put it in books and that's the way we would search. Now you can use Google if you prefer. Uh, my the best way, the absolute best way, you can see on the side, is that farsight.hill.airforce.mil. So Hill Air Force Base, located in Ogden, Utah, is responsible. They're the official FAR, they're the official body of knowledge uh, function uh, in, the, in the federal uh, space, market space, that maintains all this. And so it is the best way to search because it's gonna have all of the individual agency FAR supplements uh, as well as the FAR itself. 
and it's updated constantly. Um, so if you think you, you know everything and six months goes by or something, well, before you submit a bid, you may want to just go back and check to see if there's any changes that occurred that could affect uh, the bid. So, uh, or when you receive that contract, uh, take a look, make sure everything is the same. Uh, it's uh, pretty quick and easy to use. Uh, I've used the farsight.hill uh, many, many times. Uh, become familiar with it because it makes uh, your job easier as well and keeps you in compliance with the regulations that affect your contracts. So here's a um, uh, pick screenshot, uh, farsight.hill. Uh, um, so it take you to the search function. Let me take you to the search function. So you can search at that level. You can just search the entire FAR, okay? Um, you know, or you can go to the DFAR so you can see if there's any defense acquisition regulations that are applying. And then there's also the um, search buttons at both top and bottom that allow you to go to the next level of detail. Um, so the more, it's like any other search engine, the more uh, you uh, can put in of what you're searching for, the quicker you'll get to where you want. So the FAR search, um, so you type in your search terms, as you can see there, and select FAR and FAR supplement in this particular case, and um, up will come all the information you need uh, regarding, and so we use the term here, final payment, and it takes you to the GSA's acquisition manual in this case, um, to come up with how you are going to get paid. So I would, if you are in federal contracting, if you're in that market, uh, market space, it's critical that you understand the federal acquisition regulation and searching the FAR is the quickest way to become familiar with how they work. Uh, whatever customer you have, you want to understand as much about them as you can, including their uh, rules and regulations. And I should mention also that if you are a subcontractor to a prime contractor, um, that prime contractor who has the contract with that federal agency is probably going to flow down a lot of FAR clauses, which you need to understand. So even as a sub, it's important to recognize um, that you're going to have to understand those regulations. So kind of a basic orientation. Each FAR part, they'll talk about scope, applicability, uh, the definitions uh, in FAR Part 2, uh, the policy that, that drives, pertains that part, what the original policy was, um, any procedures, or uh, the procedures will be in there. It tells you how to, how to comply, right? So how to implement that, that rule. Um, provisions and contract clauses, um, this is where provisions and clauses uh, are described in the uh, structure. So remember, practice, practice, practice makes perfect. Um, so all federal solicitations will contain references to FAR and FAR supplements. Let me just mention one thing. So if you have registered to do business with the federal government, you will have registered in a system called SAM, System for Award Management. When you register in that system, there are a lot of FAR clauses. There are some DFAR clauses in there that as you're registering, you should become familiar with. The Particularly the um, one section of, of that SAM, so it's kind of two parts. One of it is very important that you do not misrepresent your business and who you are. And the others are the standard ones. Um, they used to be a standard in every contract in a paper form, but now it's all online. And those are gonna be in every single federal contract. 
So take the time. If you don't understand them, look them up. Um, and we are certainly available. If you have a specific question, uh, we'll help you do that research and make sure you understand it because you don't want to sign up to something that you don't understand. So when, you're, so when you understand those FARs, when you take that time, understand those FARs when you uh, sign up in, uh, in SAM to do business with the federal government, because there's really no legal excuse for not understanding. Um, so the SAM registration is essentially is your certification and there's penalties for misrepresentation. So make sure you understand and they're e really easy. You click on them and it takes you to the far, that far site at Hill Air Force Base and gives you the explanation you need. And again, you really get confused, give us a call. So understanding some of the conventions uh, can be helpful. Um, I'm not going to go over each one in, in detail, but there's some words and terms. Uh, there's delegation authority and there's dollar thresholds uh, applicable to some of the FAR clauses you want to understand. Um, how those app, uh, FAR changes get applied. Uh, there's a, a process to everything. And some of the citations and the, and the other thing is, uh, so most FAR parts contain one or more of these conventions. They'll talk to a citation or a dollar threshold or a delegation of authority or all of those things. And so those are the, the key things to look for to make sure you have a full understanding of that federal acquisition regulation. The decision tree. So, Major thing I want to get across here is whatever you're looking up and you want to interpret it, that last bullet is very important. So you got to read the FAR, any agency supplements, and any deviations together because they feed off of one another. If you look at it as, as a tree, you got the, the trunk is the FAR, and then you got an agency supplement that comes off, and then off that branch, there are leaves called deviations. You want to capture all of those and make sure you understand it together. Um, and I can't stress this uh, enough uh, because sometimes if you miss that one leaf, if you will, um, you could go down the wrong path. Got to understand all three things together because they should tie together. And again, if you have any uh, questions or need some understanding, uh, please give us a call. So, what did we just learn? We learned how it is structured, how to search through it, talk about regulations and rulemaking, the acquisition process, the FARS numbering system, supplements, and interpreting it using conventions. So, Fed, let me make a point here. So, federal contracting officers are required to take several weeks of training. I was just talking to a contracting officer who was still in the uniform of the Air Force this morning uh, at a meeting, and he's been doing this for five years. And he was telling me that he is required to take nine weeks of training a year. Think about that, nine weeks. On just the FAR, it's four weeks per year. Every contracting officer goes through a four-week course just on the FAR. So you can see how important it is to them to know, to have their body of knowledge and know what they're doing so when they issue a solicitation, they get it correctly. When they negotiate a contract, they issue the contract, they get it correctly. So the message is, if they take this amount of energy and time um, to do their job, to issue the solicitation, issue the contract correctly, so don't you need to understand what you're signing up for. and in the um, pre-solicitation phase, if there's questions on some of the FARs, that's the opportunity to ask that contracting officer in writing uh, what your question is and how it applies to that particular procurement. As long as the solicitation hasn't been issued out for competition, you have an opportunity to ask those questions. So, uh, and they are required by law to respond to you 
and to all other prospective bidders. They don't use your name or the name of your company as the person or company who asked it, but they reply to all uh, interested bidders what the question was and what the answer is. And so that is probably the best source to get the answer to your question is the contracting officer who's dealing with that solicitation and is going to issue that contract. And as a matter of fact, if you, when you receive a federal contract, uh, one of the initial things that happens is a meeting with your contracting officer representative, your COR. If you have questions at that point, um, it is, I would make sure you fully understand and, and brought, bring that up to your first meeting so that there's no confusion downstream. Because once you get uh, confusion, adding there, well, gee, I thought it, this is what it meant. And, no, this is what it really means, if you understand it. Uh, make sure you get those things clarified. Um, and in some cases, they may actually change it because it doesn't make sense or add additional clarifying language to your contract. So now we've talked about the FAR at a very high level. So we're going to have three more sessions on the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and you're more than welcome to sign up. Um, and we're going to go into you know, how, it, how it works with doing market research, identifying sources, what their acquisition strategies are, how bids and proposals are solicited and evaluated, and the contract administration, post-award, um, things like payments uh, would be very, very important to understand what FAR uh, areas uh, talk to those. Uh, for example, the um, Prompt Payment Act you know, that took a long time to get into the FAR. Very important to understand that because you want to get paid as quickly as possible and make sure your contract includes the Prompt Payment Act as an example. So we're going to cover these topics and probably some more in the upcoming training sessions. Um, so please uh, sign up for the next three uh, FAR um, sessions. And so the upcoming workshops we have coming up is uh, the next section of FAR is how the government plans its contracts and issues the solicitations. Next one is how a contract, how they create the contract that you're going to get. And then the last part would be how government agencies uh, administer contracts. So those are the next three for the FAR workshops. And then we're in I'm just going to cut in real quick. There's a, okay. there's a slight error on our um, upcoming workshops on this slide. Um, the Becoming Contract Ready workshop on Monday, May 15th will actually be in Reading. And that's a full day workshop in person with Mr. Lenny Bean, um, who you just heard throughout this webinar. And the second day, Becoming Contract Ready on May 16th, will be in Eureka. So the days are swapped and they are actually full day um, workshops. All right, go ahead, Lenny. Okay, uh, good point. I just noticed that it's 10 to 11. It was a short duration. <laughs> so yeah, it will be all day. Um, and then we have a matchmaker in Vallejo. Um, and matchmaker is um, government agencies, federal and state and local government agencies and a chance to hear what upcoming procurements they have, uh, an opportunity to meet with those uh, buyers one-on-one -on -one, uh, and get to know how they do business and what is available and working with them. And all of those events are free. So if there's any questions, I can take them now and back to you, Christina. So, Lenny, there's actually, I think, one more slide. Okay. Um, we would love your feedback. Um, you're going to get an email uh, with an evaluation form. It's just a quick Survey Monkey um, evaluation, and we'd love to hear what you thought about our workshop today. And if you have any questions, um, use the chat box. Um, and it looks like we do have one question. Lenny, can you see, um, could you briefly go over interpreting the FAR using conventions? 
I'll let you take it from here. Okay, so let me um, back up to that convention slide. Okay, so conventions, um, if you're looking, so um, if you're trying to find something in the FAR or interpret it, a lot of times um, you can just like control F, control find, if you will, and, and use a word or term. So for example, you could put in payments and everywhere that, that shows up that term, um, because each one of these conventions are in the FAR, and so, or you may want to uh, look at dollar thresholds. And so you may want to look for um, what a particular agency has for uh, budget, what dollar threshold, what is their delegation of authority, what are they allowed to uh, contract for, uh, is it a million dollars, is it a hundred thousand um, dollars. So you understand in that particular agency what limitations those contracting officers have as an example. Um, so that, and sometimes though, the imperative sentences, I, uh, it, those are the kind of like the shalls, if you will, um, it uh, shall not exceed a million dollars, shall not um, uh, exceed uh, certain amounts, um, or shall not be other than a fixed price contract in a particular uh, regulation. And so those are what the conventions are used for. And by understanding those conventions, it allows you then to pull up that FAR clause and then look for that convention like delegation of authority. I hope that answers your question. This is probably one of the fuzziest things that the FAR has in it. Any other questions? So if anyone thinks of any questions after the fact, um, you'll all be receiving that evaluation email in just a few minutes. Um, you can reply to that email and we will respond to you. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me or Lenny. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day and thank you, Lenny. You're welcome.